Welcome everyone. Um, so my name's Sandra Blades um, and I'm one of the senior programme advisors with the Healthcare Staffing Programme um, at Health Improvement Scotland. And we'd just like to take this opportunity to thank everyone, um, all of our service colleagues who are here today um, in relation to the real-time staffing um, resource webinar. This is an introduction to the real-time staffing resource and also um, just an awareness of some of the information around future training sessions that will be taking place. Um, now, I know and I would like to apologise on behalf of the Healthcare Staffing Programme that a few of you did uh, actually attend in the 13th um, and there was obviously some technical issues that we will obviously learn from um, for future webinars. Um, but I think it's important to just acknowledge the fact that um, some of you did attend and we can apologise for that. Um, but we certainly welcome to the webinar this afternoon. Um, and just to go over some of the context of what we're going to be achieving today um, after some housekeeping. Um, next slide, please. So during the webinar, what we're going to do is keep your camera and microphone switched off. Um, and that's just basically just in case there's any sort of technical issues that we're obviously going to uh, potentially um, experience um, if we have all the cameras on at the one time. Now, this session has been recorded um, and will be recorded and then shared. Um, and obviously, presuming that from um, your perspective that you are consenting to be included within the recording um, with obviously um, your your um, your pictures, etc. Um, if you do have any technical support, please pop in the chat or contact, as Tracy has mentioned and shared, the HIS uh, website, um, and we'll get back to you and support you throughout this journey. Next slide, please. The aims and the purpose of the webinar um, is obviously the background to real-time staffing resources and one of the key components of that is what's the difference between what a real-time staffing resource is and what a staffing level tool is as well. Um, one of the key points of the purpose of the real-time staffing resource is the legislative requirements for organisations um, and what is possible for the future for taking all this work forward. And especially with enactment um, just around the corner. We will provide you with a demonstration of um, the real-time staffing resource in use and also share with you some of the staff experiences of um, actually applying the real-time staffing resource to support some of the safe staffing um, and risk escalation in line with the, the legislation, but certainly um, from the point of view of how it is actually applied in practice um, back in boards. And then what we're going to do is signpost to official training sessions that will take um, the practicalities and the logistics of the real-time staffing um, resource forward for you um, when you're actually going to be utilising them back in boards. Next slide, please. We have um, a suite of presenters um, and as you will see there, we have Kelly Wad Waldy, who's one of our senior programme advisors um, with the healthcare staffing programme, um, who's going to give you a run through of the, the purpose of the real time staffing resource, how it's been developed, etc. And then that will be followed by Ailey Manson, who will be providing a demonstration of the resource itself. Martin McKelvey, um, our information systems consultant as part of the healthcare staffing programme, will also be providing some of the TURAS um, platform um, and technicals of advice um, and direction um, for the, the resource and, and the platform that it's currently sitting on. And then we have the luxury of Angie Adams, who's our clinical midwifery manager, who has actually applied the real-time staffing resource in practice um, down in Dumfries and Galloway. And she will share her experience with you all um, this afternoon. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pass to Kelly, who will um, talk you through what real-time staffing is, um, how it relates to the Act, and what the resources actually entail. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. 
So yeah, I'm going to um, give you an introduction and overview um, of real-time staffing, so what it is and what it isn't, what this means in terms of the legislation and in practice, and also talk a little bit about the, the real-time staffing resources we have hosted on Turas and introduce the generic real-time staffing resource. Next slide, please. So we're all aware of the, the Health and Care Staffing Act commencing um, now from April, which isn't very far away. And under the Act, um, NHS Scotland boards will be legally required to be appropriately staffed in order to provide safe, high quality care. And this aims to improve outcomes for service users and put patient safety at the fore. So the Act outlines a number of duties and guiding principles and the overarching duty you can see on this slide now. Um, so the, the, the ability to assess real-time staffing risk and escalation of such risk is named in the Act and this includes the ability to capture severe and recurrent risk. And this will require health services to have appropriate systems and processes in place to achieve this. Um, next slide, please. So... Looking at the, the different elements of service delivery workforce is the missing piece of the jigsaw. It's critical that we can all understand the connections between having the right people in the right place with the right skill at the right time to support patient outcomes, and the delivery of um, safe, high quality care and um, to support staff wellbeing. Workforce is the key to getting that right and using real-time staffing risk assessments like the 2RAS resources will help to evidence staffing risk and support decision making. Next slide please. So while all the duties in the Act are interlinked and together with the guiding principles they, they underpin that overarching general duty and main aim of the Act. There are three duties which specifically cover staffing risk. So you'll see those circled in red on the screen. So that's duties 1 to IC, 1 to ID and 1 to IE. And the purpose of these duties relates to services evidencing everyday staffing levels are appropriate and that they can easily identify and dynamically respond when there are risks to service delivery related to staffing. So while workforce planning determines what general staffing requirements or funded establishments will look like within a clinical service area and practice um, the clinical activity, service demand, patient acuity, that might change just as the staff available to work within the service might change on a daily basis. So we need to determine what staffing is required to meet the changing daily needs of the individual patients for service. So boards are required to have systems and processes in place to evidence that they're fulfilling the requirements in relation to these duties um, and the, the digitally enabled real-time staffing resources we have hosted on Turas have been developed in conjunction with clinical experts from across NHS Scotland and they can be used by boards as part of these systems and processes to support um, the meeting the requirements in relation to these duties within the Act. These resources are not mandated and indeed some boards may have something else that they use which aligns to the legislation. So I um, would advise that you're, you're aware of and know how to use what is being used locally. Next slide, please. So uh, what is real-time staffing and how can that be defined? So it's not a new concept as such. Um, many teams do this already, although maybe not all of the elements that are required are recorded. Um, and I hope that as well as providing a definition, the benefits of real-time staffing will start to become apparent too. So um, real-time staffing resources are essentially um, risk-based decision-making tools which aim to ensure appropriate staffing and high-quality care. They were originally developed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and they do provide a quick, consistent mechanism for recording real-time workforce demand, risks and action taken to address workforce challenges and provision of safe care. No matter what the local system or process is for assessing real-time staff and risk, it should be a way of formally recording and evidencing assessments, discussions and decisions that are already taking place around are we safe to start? So recording the staffing required for the shift ahead, taking that prospective approach and that will support decision making at various levels um, relating to staffing risk in real time. Next slide, please. 
use and real-time staff and resources support a dynamic response to any identified emerging and actual staff and risks. And we'll come on to um, escalation in a second, but I think it's important to note that we all need to understand that local escalation processes will still need to be followed in terms of notifying the appropriate person that there is an unmitigated risk. So this might be via um, staff and or safety huddles, via DTICs, via email, etc., whatever your local process is. And then through the provision of that helicopter view of relevant service areas, leaders can quickly and easily get a sense of what staffing is like across all the areas that they're responsible for. Quickly identifying areas of highest risk and beginning with that support um, around those mitigating decisions around movement of staff or alteration of workload. Data over time reports will help inform that workforce planning and establishment setting. And importantly, as Sandra mentioned there before, um, there, there is a significant difference between um, real-time staffing resources and um, the staffing level tools. Next slide, please. So um, I thought it'd be, it'd be quite useful to quickly touch on and understand the difference between the two. So I'm aware that um, not all service areas will have a mandated staffing level tool as, as named in the Act, so it is important to clarify that the real-time staffing resources um, are not staffing level tools for those areas that don't already have a, a tool currently. Um, you can see the differences between the two on the screen here, but sort of in general terms, real-time staffing resources are intended to be completed um, every day at agreed points, so once per shift. Um, where a tool is done for a specified amount of time. So current recommendations um, is for a, a two week period um, annually as a minimum. The real time staff and resources are, are prospective, as we've just described, with the, the professional judgment element incorporated into the assessment, whereas the staff and level tools are a retrospective look back at, at the workload and the professional judgment element is completed via a separate tool. Um, Real-time staffing resources provide consistent data over time, identifying acute and sustained risk, recording escalation mitigation and aiding immediate um, decision making through that helicopter view where the staffing level tool is, is providing a snapshot of workload only and, and the outputs are used to aid those longer term staffing decisions. Outputs from both the real-time staffing and, and the relevant tools should be considered as part of the common staffing method for those um, areas that are required to use this. Next slide, please. So circling back now to the duties within the Act, so 1-2-IC is specifically about assessing and recording the staffing required for the shift ahead and identifying any risks. And those risks that can't be mitigated should be escalated further. So this type of assessment should um, consider and report on patient acuity or level of intervention where that's appropriate. So um, this might not suit um, sort of non-patient facing or unscheduled care services. Complexity of their workload um, would need to be considered differently. And um, although this is not actually required in terms of the Act, it does help to provide context um, to the, the required staffing and can aid decision making. The number and skill mix um, of available staff, so who's working and who is actually here and available for the shift ahead, and what's the professionally judged staff and requirements, so who is actually needed for the shift ahead to get through the planned or predicted workload. What risks have been identified if there's not enough of the right staff, so for example through insufficient skill mix and how, how might this impact on service delivery? And what mitigations, if any, can be taken ahead of escalation? So, for example, contacting staff bank, if that's available to you, or a senior clinician coming off of their supernumerary management time to take some of the clinical caseload, etc. Next slide, please. So, duty one to ID relates to escalation processes. And these should provide a consistent means of recording the escalations and mitigations of any identified staff and risk. So the resources we've developed on TURAS will allow for that and they will um, record if appropriate clinical advice has been sought out as part of the escalation response.
So as mentioned previously, there should be clear local processes in place for staff to follow. Staff should feel psychologically safe to use these processes. They should feel confident to raise a staffing concern and feel their concerns are being listened to and acted upon. So staff should know who they're escalating to. This should be someone with lead responsibility and with a knowledge of the service area. So there's some examples there um, on the slide. And leaders should know what mitigating actions they're able to take before they need to escalate further. There also needs to be a clear process for feeding back to the person or team who have raised the risk, so closing that loop. Next slide, please. In terms of the feedback loop, the local processes should make provision for, for anyone who's been involved in assessing or identifying the staff and risk, mitigating the risk, escalating the risk or providing advice to be notified of the decisions that have been made and why they've been made. This will make the process clear and transparent and it'll help staff feel enabled to raise the concerns. There should also be a clear local process for those involved to record any disagreement they have with the decisions that have been made and um, to request that that decision is reviewed. Next slide, please. And uh, moving on to um, 12IE, which covers severe and recurrent risk. So organisations will need to use their own systems of classification around what is classed as severe and recurrent as this is not defined within the Act. I suppose a general definition would be around um, that this would be where the same risks will occur with no improvement or it could be those areas where staffing is such a challenge that it becomes a severe risk to the health of patients and staff. As we've already described, real-time staffing assessments enable the recording of difficult decisions made when there's staffing challenges and um, they will record concerns, local context and mitigation. So this is um, invaluable to evidence or flag acute or sustained risks over time. And through the reporting functions, um, the real-time staffing resources provide the organisation with an operational and strategic overview so leaders can see what's happening in real time as well as over time to identify any acute and sustained risk. And this data can be used in conjunction with reports from existing local systems and processes such as DATEX. Next slide, please. So, um, I mentioned earlier that the Act doesn't mandate any particular tool or system for, for real-time staff and risk assessment, so boards are able to do this um, in any way they like, as long as it aligns with the legislation, um, and to support boards to meet their legislative requirements and in conjunction with clinical experts from across Scotland, um, we have developed a suite of digitally enabled real-time staff and resources. These currently cover critical care in HDU, mental health inpatient and adult inpatient service areas in terms of nursing and um, for midwifery, both hospital and community-based maternity services have a, a dedicated tourist resource and these have been in use for some time. Next slide, please. So um, those resources um, obviously don't cover all professional groups or service areas, so um, although, as we've said, many boards may have their own way of recording real-time staff and we have been commissioned by Scottish Government to develop a generic real-time staff and resource to facilitate any group that's included within the, the Act to undertake a real-time staff and assessment and capture those relevant mitigations and escalations as we've described to align with the legislation. So as the name generic suggests, all professional groups and, and service areas should be able to, to use this resource. So whether that's community services such as mental health, physio or hospital at home, etc. Um, inpatient HP services, the emergency department, paediatric wards, outpatients, labs, pharmacies, paramedics, any service in theory should be able to use this resource. Next slide, please. And the we had a multi professional expert working group um, who worked in conjunction with colleagues from NEST to develop this resource. Um, a lot of the work that was that was already done for the existing TURAS resources as well as work which was in development um, such as adult inpatient, real-time staffing, they've 
come together to, to inform the development of this generic resource and it's allowed this work to progress quickly. Um, I think it has been a bit of a challenge getting agreement and direction from such a diverse group of professions, but um, we have we have got consensus and there is aware, an awareness that it can't be everything to everyone, but it definitely will fulfil the legislative requirements and inform decision making within board. Um, the process uh, of onboarding has begun and we're in the final stages of getting this resource ready for launch at the end of this month, which is next week. Um, and the national training sessions begin in early March. So the links will be shared for the training. They'll share those in the chat. Um, and the, there are some additional features in the generic resource which will be added to the existing resources soon and these relate to the escalation response particularly so recording that feedback's been provided recording whether the appropriate clinical advice, advice has been sought out or not and also um, if you don't agree with the decision and would like a review there is a facility to record this um, but the the although the um, resource has got a, a facility to record all of this, please be mindful that TURAS will not notify anyone automatically um, and local processes do still need to be followed around any of those points. Um, and we do know there is an appetite for this resource within boards and there has been a lot of positive engagement so far and launch is eagerly awaited. Um, so I think I'll finish up there and hand back to you, Sandra, so that we can move on to the demo. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, a lot of um, expert work has went into the development of the resources. Um, so, so well done to all of the users involved um, in that process. Um, I'd like to just pass on to Ailey Manson, who's our colleague, um, who is the delivery manager for real-time staffing, who's going to give you a high-level demonstration of the resource itself. Thank you, Ailey. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Kelly. Um, what I'm going to do is just share my screen in a moment. But before we get started, I just want to say that this is a demonstration and it's been done in a test environment with a test account. So it's not real data that you're seeing and I'm not showing you or doing anything that I shouldn't be doing. Um, what I will also say is that as part of the launch next week, we are um, recording demos and we are creating a user guide so don't worry about taking notes this is really a high level high level run through and to show you what is to come with the generics resource that launches next week um so i've just shared my screen if someone could give me a wee thumbs up just to confirm that you're seeing what you should be yep great thank you so much and i'm going to log in to Turas. This take, oh, apologies. Seems to be gonna go slow. Here we go. So this takes me to my Terrace homepage and I'm going to click on the real time staffing tool here. So this is your landing page for the real time staffing resource. And first of all, we're going to click through create assessment. So click create assessment and I'm going to select the site for which I want to create the assessment and also the team. Um, if you only have access to one team, then you wouldn't have drop downs that would be pre populated for you. I'm then going to input the start date and time of the census period for which I'm creating the assessment. Shown. And you'll see there the resources calculated the total length based on what I've input. I'm going to click next and this takes me to my workload and capacity tab. So first up we're asked, do you wish to record patient acuity? If I select no, then I'm simply put on to the next section. But if I select yes, I'm asked to input my patient numbers from levels one through to five. So I'll just input some data here and you'll see that there are further information icons which have some descriptions for those levels there for some further information. 
The resources calculated my total patients based on what I've input, and I'm then asked, do I wish to record bed numbers? So again, as always, clicking no moves me on to the next question. But if I select yes, then I'm asked to input information on my core beds and any surge beds that might be in use. And you'll see here it has totaled up my available beds and my percentage beds in use. I'm then asked, do I wish to record patient interventions? And again, I can select no or yes to record any interventions missed from the previous census period and any planned interventions for this census period. And again, this further information icon can be clicked to provide some more detail around that. It is worth noting that you can also respond no for patient acuity, beds and interventions and simply move on to recording your staff. For the purpose of the demo, I'm going to record it all and I'm going to, once I'm happy with this, I'm going to click next section, which takes me on to my staffing levels. So there's a confirmation statement up the top just to reconfirm what census period I'm populating this for. And this is where I can begin to enter my staffing information based on levels, the start date and time of the census and input my actual and who, uh, how many staff I professionally judge I should have within the census period. You can add as many staff types as required from this drop down here. And you can also add Let's add another band two who might start at a different time from the previous band twos that we've recorded. And input the number of staff with that start and end time. Once you're happy that this table is representative of all the staff that you have on shift and you've input your actual and your professional judgment counts, you can then move on to the next section, which is supplementary staffing. So you're asked if any of the staff within the census are supplementary staffing. Again, I can select no and move on or yes, and I'm asked to provide some details as to any staff that are supplementary staffing. And you'll see here again, it's calculated a total for me. Next up is supernumerary staffing. So are any of the staff within the census supernumerary? Again, no or yes, I'm asked to just detail any counts here. You're then asked if you wish to provide some local context. So this isn't necessary, but it might be a good opportunity to provide any information that could be relevant for the census period. Once I'm happy with all the staffing information that I've input, I'm going to click next and move on to risk and mitigations. So I'm asked, do I have any risks? Again, no or yes. And a list of six risks have appeared. These have been nationally agreed um, and you're able to select all that apply. You're then asked whether you need to mitigate. If we select yes, then a list appears of any mitigations that you can put in place. There is an other field here also where you can input any other mitigations that you're able to put in place. You're asked if you've been able to fully mitigate. If you select yes, then you move on to the next question and you're asked, do you need to escalate? Now, if I select no, two further questions appear and the first one is asking whether I have capacity to support staff being moved to another area. You can select yes, not applicable. If you select no, then you are asked for some reasoning as to why you cannot support staff being moved. And you're then asked, do you have capacity to absorb additional workload? And the same again, if you select no, then you're asked for some reasoning as to why. For the purpose of this demo, I'm going to ensure that we need to go through the escalation response process. So I'm going to select yes to do I need to escalate. And you'll see here it's asking me who I escalate this to. Now, as Kelly's already um, emphasised, this will not automatically send um, this escalation to that individual and you should follow your own local processes. So this is a way of logging it. Once I'm happy with all of this information in the assessment, I'm going to click create. I'm prompted again, are you sure I am? And because we've added an escalation, it has taken me to the add escalation response page. And you can see here 114, this is the assessment that we've just created together. 
I'm going to click add escalation response and I'm then taken to the escalation response form. The first question is whether I seek appropriate clinical advice. If you select yes, then it's going to ask who provided the advice and what advice was given. It's asking, do you need to mitigate? Again, I can select no and move on or yes. And this is any additional mitigations that you're able to put in place post escalation. And as always, we can select other for free text and we select all that apply. You're asked whether there is ongoing risk. If we select yes, then it's going to pull through those risks from the original assessment and you're asked to confirm which ongoing risks there are. Is there further escalation required? So this escalation process can be completed as many times as appropriate. For the purpose of this demo, I'm going to escalate one more time. So I'm being asked who I escalated this to and any further comments. Once I'm happy with this first escalation response, I'm going to submit. And again, because it's still active, I'm taken to the escalation response page where I can see our assessment and add another escalation response. What has then happened is it has documented escalation response history and I can click in to see any previous escalation responses here. Same questions again. I'm going to twist through this. Do I need to mitigate? And this time when asked, is there ongoing risk? I'm going to select no. And is there further escalation required? No. And what this does is this is going to then move us into the closing off the escalation process with these two further questions. So have I informed the initial escalator of the outcome? This is a really key component. If I select no, it's asking that as a minimum, I've informed the service area. And you'll see here it's not going to let me progress unless I've had that conversation there. And it's then asking, have you mitigated or accepted the risk? Now, I could have mitigated, but I could also have accepted the risk. And it might be me that has accepted this risk, in which case it's pre-populated this. But it could actually be somebody um, senior or a different colleague that perhaps doesn't have access to the Turas Real-Time Staffing Resource. And you can input their name in here for that record. Once I'm happy with this, I'm going to click Submit. Again, prompted, are you sure? And I'm taken to this completed escalations page here, which can also be accessed from the home page in the completed escalations tile. So I can see this is our assessment that we've completed together. And there are two things I can do. I can now view this assessment and all of the escalation history, or I can add a closure response. So clicking closure response, You'll see there's now two rows to the escalation history and I can input any supporting comments. And select any of those initially escalated risks I think are still outstanding. Again, this could be you or you could be responding on behalf of anybody else. And here it's given me the opportunity to request a review. So we've escalated. The escalation has been closed because it's gone through a few escalations, um, but as an individual, I have the opportunity to request a review. If I select no, then it's OK. I'm just logging a response to this process. If I select yes, it's asking me to provide some further information as to why I'm requesting a review. Once I'm happy with this response, I submit. And then the last stage I just want to show you is again, clicking into this escalation, we added a closure response, but we can go to this view page here, which has all of those original details from our assessment. And if I scroll down to the bottom, you can see the full history now. So it's been through two escalations, escalation active, it was closed and then a review was requested. I've now taken us through all of the stages. That was a whistle stop tour so apologies for the speed but i will stop sharing my screen and hand back to sandra thank you thanks ailey um can we actually give a demonstration of the non-patient uh, facing um there's a lot of questions and queries within the chat so um if you could possibly 
go back in and just do that for a couple of seconds. Um, that would be really appreciated before we move on to Martin. Thank you. You're on mute, Ailey. Apologies. The process is the same for non-patient facing, so I'm going to go in and create an assessment. And here, where it asks me, do I wish to record patient acuity? I would select no. Um, do I wish to record patient interventions? I would select no. And then really, I would move on to logging my staffing levels. So it skips the whole section about recording patient numbers and um, bed numbers and interventions. Does that help? That's lovely. Thank you very much. It was just there was a few questions within the chat, so that's very much appreciated. Um, just to reinforce, this is obviously a high level demonstration at this point, and um, the training sessions will be able to pick up the logistics and the practicality of actually how to utilise the resource. Um, so thank you very much, Ailey. And I'd like to pass on to Martin now, um, who will give us a, a bit of a background into how the roadmap will be through to safe care and obviously the real-time staffing within the Touras platform. Thank you, Martin. Hey, thank you, Sandra. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Martin McKelvey. I'm the Information Systems Consultant for the Healthcare Staffing Programme at TIS. Uh, I'll try to keep this relatively high level in terms of the kind of digital landscape surrounding the legislation and some of the work that's been going on nationally. Uh, Sandra touched upon there, uh, mentioned safe care. So safe care is a module under the national e-rostering contract that gets signed in 2021. Um, that is mandated. Flow boards do need to implement the national e-rostering uh, contract. Uh, however, we acknowledge that that implementation will take a number of years for boards to fully adopt the Optima module, which is the rostering component, and also then uh, subsequently uh, enable them to go live with safe care. Um, so given we know that that won't be in place for all boards uh, by the 1st of April this year in terms of legislation, that, that's partly the reason or the reason we've developed this suite of applications with Nest Digital uh, in terms of the Touras application and the generic one that we just seen there. Um, the, there's been a lot of collaborative work uh, done between the kind of different work streams. Uh, so Healthcare Improvement Scotland, Scottish Government Policy Team, Nest Digital, Nest Technological Services and NSS uh, National e Rostering Team uh, meet on a regular basis to ensure that these work streams are aligned, uh, which will then ensure that the, uh, the transition between uh, the TURAS application into safe care will be far more seamless. Um, the, the current state we've touched upon already, we've got the kind of four applications live and are just about to go live with the generic application on the 20th of February. Um, we have, in terms of safe care, we have brownfield sites, what we'd call them. Those are boards who, um, prior to the national contract, already had procured um, the e rostering solution and have adopted safe care already. So there's a lot of, there's a few boards working already up and running with that. Uh, we've also been working with some of the greenfield sites. So those are boards who are really, uh, they are at the first stage of the national implementation. So they are at a more advanced stage and there'll be boards who haven't potentially even began their national implementation. The, that national implementation of the national industry contracts, the supported implementation phase runs till the end of this year. Um, however, that is working with the supplier to enable boards to get up and running with the, the, the national uh, rostering solution. However, it's then onto boards for how they implement them uh, locally. So that may take a number of years for some of the boards to do so. Uh, we touched on PON already. There's a couple of boards that utilise their own system. So we're not mandating the TURAS real-time staffing uh, TURAS applications. Um, and we also have done quite a lot of work uh, with Nest Digital around developing dashboards um, and data over time reporting uh, on back of the application. So you, it's not just the application you get, you get um, a dashboard to support real-time staff and decision-making. 
reviewing of risks and escalation, but also we then have built data over time dashboard reporting, which will help you meet legislative duties in terms of identifying where you have severe and recurring risk. Um, so to support the kind of transition over to safe care, um, there has been a lot of work done between those kind of core groups I mentioned, but also working with the, the brownfield sites and the greenfield sites to work on things like what we would call master or national configuration of safe care. That is uh, a fancy way of saying where we have a drop down in the system, that that's a once for Scotland approach. Uh, so only recently in January, the National Reduction Programme Board approved the first iteration of what na national configuration looks like for safe care. Um, so we, that will now be deployed. I guess what the safe care originally uh, sort of out the box um, was designed for nursing areas. However, what we've done is we have made that far more generic and far more meaningful to hit all professions. Um, so we've engaged with different stakeholders to ensure that that, that is more generic and will meet uh, all professions requirements in terms of areas like what are risks and mitigations, etc. So there's been a lot of good work done around uh, making that a once for Scotland approach to safe care. We took some of the learning from the TURAS application that we've been developed. We looked at things like the mitigations, how how often are mitigations getting used, do we need them, Do we, can we get rid of some to try to standardise that. So a lot of the learning we took from the TURAS application, we have played into uh, the conversations around how we configure uh, safe care going forward. Um, we've also done a pilot exercise with NHS Western Isles. So we know safe care works for nursing areas because the brownfield sites already have it up in nursing areas. But what we wanted to test was, will this work for AHPs and other professions who aren't uh, kind of inpatient nursing or midwifery areas? And we're coming to the kind of end of that pilot and it's been very successful. It's a lot of great learning uh, and we are confident that that will meet the requirements of legislation for all professions. So it's been uh, a real credit to NHS Western Isles for a kind of rapid implementation uh, across multiple professions uh, for that module. Um, in terms of HIS, we do have a duty to monitor compliance with the legislation. Uh, we are able to do that for the TURAS applications. Um, and we will work with uh, NSS or NES on a national reporting platform that will, will enable us to monitor compliance on safe care going forward. Uh, but we do have powers within the duty to request information from boards. So if, if we deem necessarily, we can request boards to kind of evidence that they are utilising the module to ensure compliance with legislation. Um, I guess the future state and the future vision for NHS Scotland is that all boards and all professions uh, covered by the legislation would implement safe care uh, module. There are two parts within safe care. Uh, safe care phase one um, will look at what your planned roster is. So what does your demand say that you need? Uh, and it'll do a comparison between what the demand template is and what staff you actually have on the floor on that day. Um, you then have the ability to do professional judgment on that. So say whether or not you agree or disagree with what that's saying. So if it's coming out and saying that you are significantly understaffed, therefore you're red, um, then you can override that to say, in fact, I'm not red. I've got mitigation in place. I actually feel I'm OK today. So therefore, I'm, I'm going to change my RAG status to green. Uh, and it also has a functionality to raise red flags, which are uh, risk escalation. Um, functionality within the system. So any profession that doesn't have a staffing level two or an acuity based staffing level two currently would utilise safe care phase one. Safe care phase two is for areas uh, that do have a staffing level two currently, which sits on SSTS platform that has, is acuity based. Um, at the moment, we have signed off our adult inpatient uh, staffing level two for use within safe care. Uh, and that covers 16 specialties within uh, adult and patients. We're currently doing some testing on uh, paediatrics and neonates as well, and also critical care uh, to try ensure to try deploy uh, calculations in the background that will generate recommended staffing levels based on the patient acuity. So that work is ongoing, but adult and patients certainly is ready for boards now to be deployed uh, across the NHS Scotland. Um, that does present. NHS Scotland with some opportunities for staffing level tools in the future. Um, so the current staffing level tools are hosted in SSTS and we are looking at whether or not we can host them under the national contract. 
To date, we are uh, extremely confident that we will be able to host them within the safe care module. Uh, we've successfully tested that, uh, but it's just going to take us a wee bit of time to make that transition over. One of the huge benefits of running a staffing level tool from safe care directly is that we're not limited to a two week period uh, like we are at the moment. So if a department is realizing putting in a patient acuity on a day to day basis, then we can extend the date parameters to look at, OK, over this full year, which will be much more representative of activity than a two week period. What's that telling us in terms of recommended staffing levels based on patient acuity over a full year? Uh, so there's huge benefits for NHS Scotland in transitioning to safe care, but we need to be recognising that this implementation to safe care will take a number of years and all boards are at different stages at the moment. So at this moment, the, the kind of tourist stuff that we've seen at the moment is ready to go. Areas can be onboarded at relative pace, whereas the national implementation requires uh, a, a whole lot of additional workload uh, because you need to get up and running with the rostering component first before you can even think about starting to implement safe care phase one or safe uh, phase two. I think that's all I'm looking to cover here. So I'll hand you back to Sandra. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. It's all very complex, isn't it? And quite mind blowing. Um, but a lot of excellent work um, has obviously been undertaken. Um, so thank you, Martin, for sharing um, that information. It's uh, extremely valuable. Um, I've got the great honour to pass on to uh, my colleague, Angie Adams from NHS Dumfries and Galloway, who's clinical midwifery manager, who's actually going to go through the experience that they have within Dumfries and Galloway on the maternity um, to rash real time staffing resource. So over to yourself, Angie, and thank you so much for attending today. Hello, thanks, Sandra. Yeah, um, so to be honest, um, We've been on quite a journey within Dumfries and Galloway, certainly within maternity services, and it and it's been quite interesting from time to time and a bit challenging as well. But I can go through that obviously when I'm talking. Can I have the next slide, please? So we started this journey way back in 2021, and um, some of our maternity staff were involved nationally looking at the development of initially a spreadsheet to capture all the data. And then obviously, um, and to actually looking at developing to, uh, the TURAS um, platform. So we started testing the spreadsheets in sort of June 2021. Uh, and we used them for quite obviously right up until we actually went live with TURAS in 2023 um, on the 1st of April. Um, again, we had lots of training that we involved all the staff in. All the staff have got access to the system um, and it works really well. Um, so we, anyway, we started with the TURAS platform, as I say, on the 1st of April 2023. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So um, in a little bit of preparation for this um, presentation, I obviously asked a lot of the staff, midwifery staff how they felt about the system and obviously the experience of using both the spreadsheet and also the, the, the um, system. Um, and in, initially, a lot of the staff had kind of got used to the spreadsheet and were really reluctant to move to the TURAS platform. And they thought, oh, no, it's another change. We really like this, or, you know. Um, but obviously, um, as um, Ailey had demonstrated once she's actually start to use the system, it's actually really, really easy to complete the assessments. Um, and again, someone else said, yeah, I was dreading using the system, um, but it was very easy to use. Um, and again, even setting staff up and getting them access to the system was very straightforward. Um, and again, as as, as um, both Kelly and Ailey have in, uh, indicated, it's really, really easy to, from an escalation um, process for actually for the midwives to escalate and obviously for myself as a senior manager to actually add an escalation response. And it's very, very straightforward. Slight drawback is our data over time reporting was delayed. But I think it's because we were so far at, at, in advance in terms of where we are 
where we were and how far we've been using it and how long we've been using it, um, it was kind of negative to start with um, because they felt we couldn't get as much information from the system as we, we did from the spreadsheets. Um, but obviously we've kind of overcome that. Can we go to the next slide, please? So some of the advantages for using it. So basically we have a, 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 a maternity huddle in the morning um, and we actually use it across all maternity services. So we cover inpatient maternity, outpatients and um, the community midwifery teams. So we actually bring two of us up onto the screen and we actually go to the visual staff report and we actually so all of the, the, the midwives have inputted their assessment prior to the huddle. And then we actually have the visual um, report that says the actual staff we have versus our professional judgment. So as a group, we can actually see very quickly what areas um, across maternity services are requiring that support. And we actually talk about our mitigation. We look at what we can actually do to help that in terms of moving staff into support or moving staff out to support, depending on what the, the acuity is. Um, and it's worked really, really well, actually. Um, our actual data from the two RAS and from the spreadsheets has informed a lot of our workforce planning. Um, and our template of staff as a result has changed for the better and we've actually increased the number of um, midwives and support staff that are on each um, shift. Um, it certainly improved our communication and around escalation. And as I said, it's identifies area of support, which has been really, really helpful. And it's very quick. It's very reactive in terms of we're actually getting solutions very, very quickly. Um, we've actually had evidence for a SARE that we had last year. So um, again, we were um, we'd been using the tool and um, it was identified by the senior charge midwife on shift that actually um, her actual staff versus a professional judgment she'd actually documented or recorded within the system that she actually required a further um, trained midwife to be on duty. So that was really good evidence in terms of our SARE and for our action planning and obviously looking at our workforce planning, we had the evidence there to, to demonstrate, particularly around the finance and how much, you know, an allocation of our budget that actually we, we, did, we did require to have uh, an extra member of staff um, on each shift or a registered a midwife on each shift and that's actually um, come into fruition and it's actually made a difference to um, how from our safe staffing point of view which is great and it's obviously um, helped with in terms of health and well-being of the staff. Um, it can be adapted and used in multidisciplinary team settings as, as um, we have indicated in the um, you know the previous discussions. Um, can we go on to the next um, slide please? So some of the challenges. So I, I suppose that we were quite slow to introducing it more than once a day. So as, as we've said, we started off doing it once a day because again, it was new and we weren't sure how it was going to go and we were all a wee bit reluctant. But actually, we're currently within the community. We're doing an outpatients department. We do it twice a day. So we do it at nine o'clock in the morning and we do it again at three o'clock in the afternoon. And then within inpatients, we actually do it four times a day. So again, it's nine and three and then nine and three. Um, we do have some challenges in terms of if our acuity is really busy and we've obviously got a heavy workload. We don't always do it as, as, as often, but we, we, we do try um, and, and do it as much as possible. Um, data over time, um, all the information is captured in the assessments, but we felt sometimes that the bed occupancy acuity has not always been as easy to see. Um, so uh, that's a sort of work in progress, but we have highlighted that. And um, again, because we're relatively um, new and using it, I mean, it's going to evolve um, going forward. Um, can I have the next slide, please? 
So overall, just to recap, it's been really a very positive experience for all of us um, that are working in with maternity um, within Dumfries and Galloway. It's a really easy system to use. There's minimal training. I mean, Ailey, as she said, did a whistle stop tour, but actually you get quicker and quicker as you're adding in the assessments and um, staff absolutely love it. It has improved our escalation and our communication um, because the um, clinical managers are part of the morning huddle. We do add the escalation response um, very quickly. Um, and obviously, if we are required to come in and help, then obviously we, we do that. Um, and as I've said, um, I think, you know, we need further development of data over time. Um, so that's really just where I'm at. And it's, it's as I say, it's a, it's a really good system to use. OK, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Angie. Um, that is very much updated. Um, sometimes it's good to hear that lived experience. Um, you know, uh, we can talk about the theory behind everything, but the practical application is really important. And I think one of the key messages, certainly from myself, is the fact that, you know, you're you're definitely en route to being able to show the evidence of compliance for the, the duties within the Act itself. Um, so congratulations to our colleagues down in Dumfries and Galloway. So thank you. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? We have an opportunity um, to look at some questions and answers. And I think one of the key messages from myself is that we've actually had a lot of questions that have been shared within the, the chat function. And a lot of the answers have been provided um, for that as well. So we're going to sort of concentrate on, if we can just bring the speakers all back together um, so that everybody's on the, the one page. Um, that we will pick a lot of the questions that have been um, shared um, within the chat function. We will certainly be passing that on to our NACE colleagues who are obviously going to be um, proactive in taking forward a lot of the training sessions, which will be taking place um, in March, the beginning of March through to um, sort of the 15th of March. So I think it's the 4th that starts um, of March and through to the 15th. So there will be opportunity for yourselves to actually attend those training sessions and to bring up some of the questions that are bespoke to your particular staff group um, or certainly um, your particular uh, board as well. So I'm going to open up to the panel here um, just to see is there anybody wants to provide any further information that we feel is relevant to the conversations and obviously the, the webinar um, this afternoon. Ailey. There have uh, rightly so been some queries about the time taken to complete and I suppose what we didn't see during my demo was the second time that you go in to complete an assessment once you've completed it once. There are a lot of things that it remembers from the last time so it'll pre-populate um, your staffing levels, it'll respond to certain questions um, that it knows that you and your setting won't need to, to answer. So we have kind of put things in place to speed up some of the some of the assessment process. Great, thank you, Ailey. Thanks for sharing that. Probably just want to add again, thanks to Angie for coming and sharing your experience. Um, it's probably, obviously, we know, Angie, you, you're coming from an inpatient setting and that, that's predominantly been the focus around that. Um, but I think it's it's more about the concept of real time staffing and how how that's helped you um, probably meet your duties that are going to be outlined within the legislation. Um, there's probably quite a lot of anxiety coming through in the chat around the relevance for them and their their processes. And obviously, as Ailey has said, so it's going back to what Sandra said at the beginning. This is not mandated that you use real time staffing um, resources that we are developing. Um, safe care is obviously the choice and that is the roadmap ultimately, but it is a requirement in the legislation that boards provide robust processes or they can evidence robust processes for that identification of risk around your workforce and your escalation and your mitigation of that. 
Um, now, if you have other processes within your board that you're using that meet all the requirements of the legislation, we don't have to mandate that you do that. Um, so obviously we've taken the time to develop the resource we would love if you use it but i think it's what's the important part is that you are able to identify where you have got staffing issues you recognize them obviously the advantage that we will have is although the the resource is going live on the 28th of February, there will be sort of reporting functions that follow a few weeks later, and that will provide you data over time where you'll be able to see sort of recurrent themes, and actually that might help inform conversations that you have to have with senior leaders in your board about your chronically um, escalating, you know, so is there something that you need to do around your workforce modelling um, or, you know, is additional resource having to come to you to, to provide that more sustainable staffing models? So um, there's, Angie, you're nodding your head, so um, I take it that is maybe something that you have experienced or have seen the benefits of? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I did have, I mean, we were on the risk register for our midwifery staffing uh, locally and obviously, you know, we kept putting in that, you know, we were escalating it and and saying, look, we don't have enough staff for moving people. You know, it, it just feels really unsafe. Um, and actually, because we had the evidence, as I said in my in 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 my uh, presentation, we actually changed our our actual template of staff for the better. And it's and we wouldn't have been able to do that if we hadn't got the the actual information there. So, um, for us, it was really well worthwhile. And I think. Um... Thank you, Angie. And as we said, this is a, a high level introduction and obviously a lot of the anxieties and queries that are coming through in the chat, as we've said, we will theme and we'll forward on to our colleagues and Nez who are going to be working with us around the sort of formal training um, for the rollout um, of the generic launch um, at the end of the month. Um, Will I pick up some questions just now, Sandra, that maybe yeah, some haven't absolutely. been answered? We've got a um, of minutes, so thanks, Leslie. So um, one of the ones is, how does this link with medium term workforce planning? It takes time to train staff. Where does this give snapshots? Um, Obviously, the, the workforce planning um, normally comes with the staffing level tools, which um, a lot of the professions beyond nursing don't have. I don't know, um, Kelly or Martin, if either of you want to pick up that yeah i can jump in there um yeah i guess, I guess it's uh, over time we will build up that picture of the staffing and uh, staffing uh, requirements on a day-to-day -day basis um and you'd be able to see if you're regularly professionally judging that you are understaffed um and also you have the intelligence around risk escalation so how often are areas identifying risks how severe is that and how regular is that so having that kind of data set builds up that intelligence around the workforce for each individual team or department that is using it that can then get played into kind of medium term workforce planning so i guess it's an audit there for each individual day on what the staffing situation is uh, and as i said around that having that risk escalation and identification of severe and recurrent risk can be played into workforce planning. Um, Leslie touched upon the staffing level tools uh, and I kind of touched upon them as well. Uh, they are primarily for nursing areas at the moment. Uh, hopefully going forward as over years, we will start to develop multidisciplinary staffing level tools. Uh, but at the moment we are transitioning what we currently have on SSTS into safe care for acuity based tools at, at present. But yeah, that's something that's definitely on our radar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I was going to say any further questions. I was going to see if Tracy had picked up any more questions, but she's got her camera off. Um, is there guidance for professional judgment? Kelly, do you want to pick that one up? Um, I think there there should be something within. The I'm trying to think what's in the further information icon within within the application, but there should be something within the user guide that should um, describe what that would be. And there is some professional judgment guidance on our website as well that could be utilised. Yeah, I can jump in there. I guess that professional judgment may be a new concept to some professions, but it is looking at knowing planned activity for that day or expected activity and uh, using your 
judgment as to whether or not you're sufficiently staffed with the staff that you have for that day, I guess. Um, so it is around putting that onto the clinicians or the experts uh, and assessing whether or not they have appropriate staffing for their planned or unplanned work going forward at the beginning of that kind of shift. Okay, okay. Tracy, have you picked up any other questions? In the chat. Yeah, the one came through, um, Angie, while you were giving your presentation, I suppose, more about your experience of um, implementing, 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 sorry, uh, real time staffing. Um, was there any more critical feedback or was it universally positive? Universally positive. I think the actual data over time has been a bit of a challenge, but I think it's because it's so new and it took a while for us to get it because this you know, you were saying it was coming and, you know, we, we were really quite, quite excited about the fact that it, but it took a while. And then when we got it, we just thought the acuity wasn't as good as we thought it was going to be. So, I mean, but that's on the whole. Yeah, it's it's been really positive. Thanks, Angie. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to see. Any um, further questions before? Any. Um, how do we use this for AHP services that have both inpatient and outpatients and where therapists can be covering both on a daily basis? Um, and how and does this take into account outpatient waiting lists? Martin, you look poised uh, to I add can, to Yeah, there. I mean, so AHP as a profession that we had that had its own expert working group um, with a number of professions represented on it. Um, they came up with the definitions for the levels of interventions uh, that you wouldn't have seen potentially there, but there will be further information buttons that will detail specifically what the each levels are for each profession uh, and have further information there. Um, so I'm sure the HP expert working group, I wasn't on that, maybe dipped into one or two meetings, would have uh, thought about whether or not that solution worked for both inpatients and outpatients and community teams. But certainly we had an excellent work, uh, expert working group that kind of co-developed that and heavily influenced the, the generic real-time staffing application. Thank you, Martin. Any further key questions? Tracy, anything else for you? No, I think I think the majority um, were answered um, in the chat box, but we will go through. I can see a few more just coming through there. Yeah, um, we will we will take a record of, of the chat and the questions in the in the chat and and direct them to um, the training team for the upcoming training session. One that I've got what? seen that I don't know if it's been answered. Who completes the review when requested? So if you're asking for a review on a decision, I take it that's that's what's been answered. Asked. I guess I can jump in, uh, Leslie. I guess that that's for boards to determine local processes. Um, so if there's been a disagreement with a how a response or an escalation has been responded to, uh, the tool will record that a staff member doesn't agree with the outcome and wants a review of it, it is then up for the board to determine their own local process in the same way that they will still have their own local risk escalation processes. Um, so that's a local decision. I'm not sure if Ange Jay maybe has a kind of more yeah, no, we, on the we, floor we, experience we, of that. Yes, yeah, so certainly if it's escalated and I need to then escalate it further, then we would use our own escalation process that we have. That's slightly different for in hours as, as out of hours, but um, yeah, we just follow the same process and, and, and we document that within um, the system that we've done that. Yeah. That's lovely. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm going to ask if we can move on to the next slide, please. And thank you for the panel to um, obviously step down now. Um, really appreciate obviously your responses there. I'm going to have this opportunity to plug, um, as we always do, the learning resources that we have available. Um, and just to ensure that everybody is aware that we have level one, which is informed, and level two, which is skilled um, learning resources within the knowledge and skills framework for the healthcare staffing um, and that sits within the TURAS platform. Um, next slide please. 
Recently, we have actually launched um, a Sway and I've put a link into um, the presentation here, which means that you can access that once you get a copy of the slides. Um, and we've actually put together an enhanced level now and we're working currently on the expert level, which is the four levels within the framework um, that's supporting staff um, and colleagues and boards um, sort of moving forward in relation to the Act. Um, quick guidance chapters. Um, there's obviously the links in there to the legislation web webinars that we held. Um, so there's a lot of valuable information, which um, certainly would appreciate if you could share that locally within your teams um, and within your boards, etc. Um, so that that can be um, widely um, sort of spread out within um, NHS within Scotland. So um, thank you very much. If you could possibly do that, really appreciate it. Next slide, please. So I suppose at this point, it's really important to say that I appreciate that all your time is extremely valuable um, and we really do uh, value all your feedback, all your questions, all your queries. Um, and certainly would appreciate if you could provide us with some feedback. Um, and here's a QR code um, to either click on um, or scan and um, we will pick all that up. Um, and certainly um, it would be very much appreciated, as I say. Next slide, please. So, as always, um, we're always here to support and help um, colleagues. So, um, keep in touch. And if there's anything that, as a reflector like myself, if there, you know, something comes into your head, then please contact us through um, our email website, um, the his um, NHS .scot. So, um, by all means, um, get in touch um, with anything that you have further queries on. And as I say, we'll obviously collate all the questions and the queries that have been put into the chat and share that for the training sessions, which links will be shared. Um, for obviously the training sessions that will be coming up um, in March. So once again, thank you so much for your time. It's really appreciated and I uh, hope the rest of your day goes well. Take care now and thank you all so much. Bye bye now.